Well, good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good? Did you enjoy your weekend? A few? Good, good. Hey, you guys, do you guys not like the Broncos or do you guys have TiVo? Because this is like the first like early morning Broncos game, you know? So just, I mean, like round of applause to you guys for actually coming to church and saying church over football, right? Because there's that, there's that competition. No, I, I had a great time this weekend. My wife and I, we celebrated 10 years of marriage on Friday. Yeah, time's flown by. Uh, but we, we had a ton of fun. One, one thing we like doing every year is going up to the mountains. And it, it really seems like, you know, with our three kids, we only go on our anniversary date where we're like, let's get childcare and go up to the mountains. So we did that. We went up uh, Guanella Pass, saw the aspens. They're starting to change. But don't worry, there's still a lot of green ones. If you haven't gone up there yet, they're going to be changing later. A uh, ton of fun. Hiked, uh, had some dinner, had some dessert, came home. Just really enjoying this, this beautiful weather after kind of two weeks of really hot weather, and then we got those two days in there, right, of like snow, you know, 30, 40 degrees, whatever that was. And I shared, I think last time I preached or one of the times, uh, we just moved to a new house in Castle Rock, and so now we're trying to figure out, okay, well, how do we manage this house, right? How do we take care of this house? And so one of the things when you have a cold snap, if you've got pipes going to your, your yeah, you right, your sprinkler system, you, you have to um, insulate them and keep them from freezing. Now, thankfully, one of you, I won't, I won't call you out, uh, helped me with this, sent me a link of a video that I needed to watch to show me how to do this. So one afternoon, I was watching YouTube of this guy who went into his basement, and he's like, you just shut the valve off, open that little nut, and then he get a pail and catch all the water. I'm like, great, okay. So I'm like, boys, come on, let's go. Went down to the basement. I found where the valves are. Now, my valves did not look like his valves. He, his valves had very, very nicely labeled valves, and there was only one. Mine, I had five. And there's one pipe that comes in over here, some that goes up, some that goes down. And I'm, I'm literally like sticking my head in the wall, like trying to move around the insulation, like, where are you going to? And so I was like, all right, Quentin, go to the sink, turn on the faucet. Is it still on? Okay, we're good, <laughs> you know? I turned one off. I undid one of, the, one of the nuts. I had a pail there, caught like two drips. I'm like, sweet, I think I'm doing it, you know? And all the water still worked, right? Well, then that was the first part of the video. The second part said you got to go outside and you got to wrap up the, the pipes in towels because apparently towels are heatproof or something. I don't know. I don't know why we're doing this. But I'm like watching like, well, what kind of tape is he using? Is he just taping towels? You know, and okay. So there I go outside and I'm taping and I'm like, I think I did it, hon. You know, like, who knows? Like, we'll, we'll f find out in maybe a couple weeks or, you know, whenever we have leaks everywhere, right? But do you know how I know that I did it right? Now, check this out. Before, before the snap even was over, I drove down to the end of my yard. At the very end of our road, there is a guy who takes immaculate care of his lawn. He's got that nice grass, like the thin kind, not that like sharp prickly kind, but it's everywhere and it's thick. And I've seen him out there working on it. Like this is his thing. Well, I drove back in the neighborhood and I saw his pipes were wrapped in towels just like mine. I knew it. I knew I had done it right. But I did screw up. I did screw up because the day, that, well, I screwed up a couple times, right, hon? But one time I turned the water back on before I had put all the things back together and the towel got very soaked. Uh, but it was outside. It was okay. I took it off one day too soon because when I took it off, I drove back in and the guy still had it on until the next day. So I took it one day off too soon. I think I'll be all right, but I know he's doing it right because he's, he's just got that perfect lawn. Anyway, today we're actually in the second week of our, our sermon series we're calling The Gospel and Me, which is kind of taking a step back and looking at what is, what is the story that the Bible's telling us. Last week, Mark shared all about who God is, that he's knowable, that he's the creator, that he's forgiving, that he's loving, all these things about who God is. And this week, well, we're asking, okay, so, so what? You know, like, what, what do we do? What, what, is, what does this mean if, if we've got this great creator, all-powerful God? And, and the premise of the gospel that we can read in the Bible is that he actually wants to give us life. He actually wants to bring peace and wholeness in our life. The good news is that God wants us to experience what we can out of life. In, in John, the very first chapter of John, uh, when in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, you might have heard that. It's talking about Jesus, how he existed with God before anything was created. He created everything. And then there's a line that says, in him was life, and he was the light for all humankind. It's like, this, this is the guy where all life is sourced from, and he's bringing light so that we can see better in our world, and he's coming down to meet us. 
Like, that's the gospel. God wants to take this life and this light that he has and bring it to us. And so we get to get that, right? It's kind of like me with my house, right? Now that I have a house, I kind of want to take care of it, right? Like, we have a life. We kind of want to take care of it and, and manage it well and be responsible with it. And so where do we look? We look to those people that are doing it well, right? The guy at the end of the yard or the end of the street who's got that great yard, I'm looking to him to try to gain some of that life in his yard, right? Well, the same way that the the gospel, God has that life that we want and he's offering it to us. So so it it behooves us (laughs) to to listen. Okay, God, so what? So so where do we go? So we're going to take a look at how we can access that life, how we can take care of our yard, how we can make it to be full of life, just like his yard, yard is, his creation is. And I want us to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking back at what, what passage do we want to look at today, you know, th- this morning, where it could be anything in the Bible, because pretty much the gospel message is the whole Bible, you know, like there wouldn't be something in the Bible if that wasn't the message God had for us. But we're going through Acts, and, and I thought that's exactly where the first believers are sharing this gospel message to people throughout the world. What did they say? How did they present the gospel? What does it sound like to them? So I want us to jump into Acts chapter 10. This is when Peter is sharing the gospel to Cornelius. Uh, God had arranged this this meeting uh, supernaturally so that Cornelius sought out Peter and said, tell me what you have. Didn't even know what what Peter was going to say, but Peter knew, oh, I'm supposed to share the gospel. And this is the first time the gospel is shared with someone who is not ethnic Israel not Jewish, uh, by heritage. So this is uh, probably like most of us. I don't, I don't know what everyone's ethnicity is, but I'm, I'm not ethnic Jewish. So this is me as an outsider. I haven't had this, this revelation throughout history. What is the gospel? Who is Jesus? Um, so we're going to jump into Acts chapter 10. Oh, let me turn this on. That'll probably make it work better, huh? And... All right, Acts chapter 10, verses 36 through 43. All right, so this is Peter uh, after he's greeted Cornelius. Here's what Peter is saying. He said, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So he, he even labels it as the good news of peace, right? So there's, there's a message that God is bringing that is good, right? Like I'm talking about building life for, for us in our little yard. Uh, but he, Peter's cap... Uh, encapsulating it in in the sense of peace. There is peace. All right, what did he say about it? He said, you know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. He's talking about what Jesus did. This is where Jesus did his ministry. Now, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So, so Peter's saying, this sounds kind of fantastic, but we saw him. Like, like we saw him after he died. After he hung on the cross, he died. He was stabbed in the side with a sword. He got buried. And then he came and ate with us. Like, this is real. Like, this actually happened. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. He is the Messiah. He is the one that we were looking to to provide salvation for us. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And that's literally the end of his sermon as we record it. You can, you can read further along in your Bible, but what, what is told afterwards is that Cornelius and his whole family believes, they receive the Holy Spirit, and this is the first time that Gentiles are welcomed into this, this church of God that is forming. But look at what Peter says. He says, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. That's where I want us to focus. That is how we can access this life. That's how, how we can go over to, to God's little yard and, and learn from him all those little tips and tricks or whatever it's going to take to make our yard flourish like his. We have to believe and we have to receive forgiveness of sins. But before we go there, Peter says nothing about sins, what they are, why we need forgiveness. He just kind of assumes, you know, you've got to have your sins forgiven and you do that by believing. I want us to look at what is sin 
in our life, we, we, we have conceptions of sin, but do we really understand what this does with our relationship to God? This is the story that we need to rehearse. This is our story, who we are as a church, as individuals. This is a story that we will live into in our lives, and this is a story that we'll share with others. So it's good to always be thinking about what are the basics? What, what do I believe? What is this relationship with Jesus even looking like? What is sin? What we're going to use today, the Bible, like this, man, you could do a 10-part series on what is sin. The Bible uses many different words in both Hebrew and Greek that have different aspects, different facets of what sin is. For today, how we're going to define it is that sin is evil, just straight up evil with respect to, to God's perfect standard. Right? So if God created this, this perfect yard that flourishes and anything that's apart from him, anything that goes against what he has set up or, or how he is acting in the world, that is sin. It's wrong. It's evil. So we can view when I do sin, I'm, I'm committing evil right? In, in the world. I'm committing evil against God. Now one, one of the dangerous things I think about our current view of sin is that we think of sin as being wrong things. right? Like I did a bad thing. right? So like... Um, like speeding, right? Oh, that's a sin. Or cursing, that's a sin. I cheated on the test, that's a sin. Uh, you know, I lied, that's a sin. You know, and so we kind of keep bank in our head that our sin are, are little actions that we've done that God doesn't like, right? And, and, and that's true, that those things are sin. But if, if all we're thinking that sin is, is just little actions that we're doing, we start thinking, God just wants me not to sin. You know, like, like the, the, the problem of sin, like the, the reason that sin is bad is because God is perfect and I am not. I'm sinful. I, I do little sins. And so we think what I need to do is, is, is be perfect. I need, I need to, to be not sinning. You know, so, so we start living our lives trying hard to not step over that line. Or we start becoming content with certain amounts of sin, knowing that God understands or that he'll forgive me, right, through Jesus. But we start living as if the problem of sin is that I'm not perfect enough for God. And mo- I don't know about most of us. That's common. That's a common belief that when we are living, we're trying to be perfect enough for God, whatever that standard is, and hopefully I've done it enough. But, but that is actually misrepresenting who God is. God is not looking at us. You know, I, I view it like, um, like a headmaster at a school or, or like my middle school principal. Where like, I did not know this guy. He's kind of gruff looking. You know, he has glasses down on his, the bridge of his nose, and at lunch, he just sit there and watch the kids waiting for one of us to sin, you know? He's just like, hey. Pick that up. You know, it's like he didn't care about us. He just wanted to make sure we're following the rules. Like, and, and we've got to be careful that we don't view God like that. Or like he's some teacher that only, is, only cares about the grades, right? You ever had a, that teacher where it's like, you know, he or she just doesn't even care about me or my learning style or how, how I'm connecting with this. They just want me to mark the right answer whatever way possible, right? Um, or, or I view it like, who has to grade Scantrons? You know Scantrons, like those multiple choice tests where you have to fill in the bubble with uh, number two pencils, make it dark enough, fill the whole hole so that you get credit for it? Someone's got to like run those through a machine. It's almost like we view God as like he takes our life, runs it through the machine, and then he gives it back. B minus, Brad. You know, you missed number 18, number 24, number 36. You know, better luck next time. But, but when we live our life as if we're trying to just get a good enough grade, like all God cares about is whether or not we're doing sins or that or we aren't doing sins, we're, we're, we're compressing his character. We're missing out on that relational love of our God. We, we talk about how God is a God of love and God is a God of relationship, and yet our understanding of sin completely misses that element. The problem of sin is not that we aren't perfect enough for God. The problem of sin is that we reject him. I'm supposed to say that behind me. Can you guys help me in the back? That's perfect. I, I don't know if this is just, isn't working in batteries or whatever. The, the problem with sin is not so much that we aren't doing enough to be perfect enough for our holy God. The problem is that we reject God. We don't want to be with him. And that, that manifests itself in different ways. That manifests itself in disobedience, in harming other people, committing evil, in, in refusing to worship God. But we essentially, when we sin, we're saying, I, I don't want you, God. To, to God, sin is personal, right? It's not uh, just uh, actions that we're doing. It's not grades that he's checking us off. When you look through the Bible and how it views sin, in the Old Testament, 
many times uh, Israel, God's chosen people, sinned. And he uses this metaphor over and over about a, a jilted lover. Where especially, I'm not going to read these, they're, they're long, but the most riveting examples of these are in Ezekiel chapter 16 and then Hosea chapter 1 and 2. Where God says, you, Israel, my people, you were like a daughter that someone kicked out, left on the side of the road and left for dead. That no one wanted. I picked you up. I cleaned you. I raised you. I clothed you. I, I gave you beautiful dresses, beautiful necklaces. You became a queen and I said, I'm committed to you. I will marry you. And I married you. And we were living together well. And you decided you were going to sell your jewelry and use that to to pay for other people to come and love you and run away from me. You chose not to love me. It's just this this passionate plea where where God is saying, this is not just a matter of you did wrong, therefore you need to leave. It's you broke my heart. I gave you everything and you rejected me. You didn't want me. This is emotional to God. Our sin is is, is a, a personal rejection of relationship. And that, that's what happens to God. So to God, sin is personal. And we need to make sure that we understand that whenever we're sinning, whenever we're committing evil in the world, it's not just that God is marking us down. You know, we're missing points on that. But rather, we're breaking this relationship with him. So you can kind of view it one way. If we view sin as just kind of my little things that I'm trying to do right and wrong is like me and my house. Like, if I forget to water my lawn, my lawn turns brown and dies. Oh, well, it's just my lawn. It doesn't really affect anyone. I think sometimes we kind of view our sin like that. Oh, I, I did this little thing. That's all right. Didn't really hurt anyone. That's okay. God's okay with that. But if we see that sin is personal, all of a sudden it's not I'm just being negligent and my yard's suffering. It's like I'm going over to that real nice guy's yard and I'm like breaking his tree branches off at night. You know? He wakes up and it's like, what are you, what are you doing? You know, I go over there, I break a window. I write graffiti on the side of his house. I kick over his potted plants. I step on his rose bushes, break them. You know, it's like, what are you doing? Like, if, let's, let's say that that guy at the end of my street, I don't know him. <laughs> if you're watching, hey. <laughs> or in the future, right? Yeah, it wasn't me, you know. Let, let's say he wanted to have a relationship with me. And then he knows that every night I come out and I destroy everything that he's created. I, I commit evil against him, right? So it's not just affecting me. It's now affecting him. There's, there is beef between us. There's no way that he invites me over to his house. I've placed a barrier relationally between me and him. So when we sin, we're doing that. We're wrecking God's creation. He's created this good, this perfect world. And we, we're committing little acts of vandalism. And we're ruining the thing that he, that he created that's his. I mean, he'll, he'll call the cops on me. <laughs> like, you can't, you can't do that. And that's the thing. God says that he's going to make everything right again. He's going to rebuild the garden. He's going to make things whole. But you kind of can't have me running around if he's going to make something brand new. And he's going to remake that that house or the tree or the garden or the bush or his lawn. And and that's the sin problem, right? It's, it's, I'm guilty. I don't belong in a world where he's cultivating lawns because I'm, I'm destroying things. I'm destructive against him. But then also, I don't even want a relationship with him. There's a huge barrier between him. I mean, at that point, he, he can't even talk to me, right? Because I'm, I'm not trying to listen. I'm hiding from him, right? Every single time I do something, I run away. And that's where Jesus comes in. That's where, Je- that's where we need Jesus. When we talk about him dying for our sins on the cross, he's paying for two things. One, the guilt that we've, we've earned through our actions, our vandalism, our evil in God's world. And, and two, he's removing that barrier between me and God. So it's like this. Let's say one night after I've vandalized everything, this guy's son at the end of the road goes out to Home Depot and Lowe's using out of his own pockets, you know, he, he buys a new tree, replants it, buys new rose bushes, replants those, paints over all the graffiti, puts up a new window, and everything is restored. And then later that night, I look out my window and I see the cops coming for me. The lights are on, they park out in front of my house, but instead of arresting me, they arrest his son. And, they, and then the next morning, the guy comes out to me and says, Good morning, Bradley. How are you? Why don't you come over to my house? I see that you're struggling a little bit there with your sprinkler system. I'll, I'll teach you the, the tips of the trade. You know, I'll show you how this is done. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wait, how, how did this happen? He said, don't worry, they caught my son. He was the one who was vandalizing everything, but we can, we can build it back together. Like, that's what Jesus is doing. He's taking that payment 
that we had earned, and then he's paying for it, right? So, so, that, so that now the penalty is paid for. But not only that, he also undid all the vandalism that we had done. He, he has reversed everything that we have gotten ourselves into. All that animosity that we had stored up against this man, he undoes it all. So now we're back on level ground where God is offering this invitation. Come, spend some time with me. I will teach you how to grow. I will teach you how to bring life to the world in your life and to everyone else's life. And that's, that's what Jesus has done on the cross. And there's this relational component now where God is offering an invitation. Come, Brad, have tea with me, 4 p.m. on Friday. Let's spend some time together that was never possible with my sin. And so that's, that's what forgiveness of sins looks like. Well, how do I access it? Peter said it's through believing. Just, just believing. <laughs> you know, it's not, not like I've got to make my lawn look good enough to be like, hey, God, you want to invite me over? I kind of got this thing down, don't you think? You know, like, but that's how we sometimes operate, is that we're trying to be good enough so that we can demonstrate, God, I'm worth your time. And God's saying, I've already demonstrated worth my time with my son who died and paid for all this barrier, and I want to be with you. And believing is accepting that invitation. What does believing look like? It's two different ways. Two different ways that we accept that invitation. We, we enter into God's presence and learn with him. One, with your mind, and the other is with your actions. So the believing with your mind, that's the intellectual belief. Like when Peter's going through and saying, uh, Jesus was the one that we, that we read in the prophets who was going to judge the world. Like, he is the Messiah. You have to believe, yes, Jesus Christ is the chosen one, the Messiah. He's the son of God. Yes, he did live. Yes, he did die. Yes, he did resurrect from the grave. The grave couldn't hold him. We have to believe these things with our head and say, I agree. That sounds good. That's right. That's true. But then there's a second part of the belief. It's, am I living as if that were true? It, are my actions in line with that belief? Because, again, there's, there's two different ways. If I'm still believing that I'm just not perfect enough for God, actually, you immediately answer, well, I did this. I yelled at my kids maybe a little bit too much. You know, I, I, I did that. Uh, maybe you start uh, saying it in terms of uh, good things that you've done. You know, I haven't read my Bible in a long time. Like the whole idea of how you are doing spiritually is all tied back to what you're doing or not doing according to some standard that you've made up because you think that how I'm doing with God is, is how close I can get, how, how good I can be. But if we truly believe that Jesus died for our sins, we be believe that we have forgiveness of our sins through him, it looks a lot like love and wanting to be with God, wanting to sit down with him. There's a passage I just read in, in Luke. It's at the um, end of Luke chapter 7. We won't we won't read it, but I'll paraphrase. You've probably heard this story. It's uh, Luke chapter 7, 39 through 47. If you guys have a, a Bible and you want to follow along. Jesus was invited to a religious leader's house to hang out, spend some time with him. And it says, while he was there, there was a woman, and it describes the woman in this way. Uh, she lived a sinful life. Like, that's lit, like, didn't say name, doesn't say what she looked like, doesn't say what she did. It's just, she lived a sinful life. So there's a contrast. He went to a, a teacher of the law's house. His name was Simon. And then there's this woman who shows up who lived a sinful life. So she's like, you know, pretty far down there. She's certainly not close to God, right? Well, she comes up to Jesus, and she washes his feet with her tears and her hair. And then she kisses his feet and pours perfume on his feet. It's like the most awkward, most tender expression of love that you could, like, possibly think of. Like, in the middle of this, like, privileged religious leader's house, right? And, and it says this guy, Simon, was thinking in his head, if Jesus was really a prophet, if he was really from God, he would know who that was that was touching him. There's no way that he's from God because he, like, he wouldn't let this sinful woman touch him like this. Like, this is, this is inappropriate, right? And you know what Jesus, Jesus, who can read minds, by the way, he said, Simon, I have something to tell you. So I was like, oh, what? And Jesus said, there, was, there were two men. They both owed money to a man, one owed about $100,000, the other $10,000. Neither of them could pay them, but the man forgave them of their debts and said, you know what, count, count it even, you don't have to pay it back. And he said, Simon, which of those two people do you think loved, um, shoot, I gotta, I gotta read this back. Uh, which, which one loved uh, the, the person more? Um, or, or um, good night, who's, who's reading it? What did Jesus say? 
which one of them will love him more? The person that they, they owed the money to. And Simon says, I guess the one with the larger debt. And Jesus says, you're exactly right. And then he points to the woman and says, Simon, this woman, ever since I came in, has washed my feet with her tears and her hair. She anointed me with oil. She has not stopped kissing me. You never washed my feet. You have not honored me in any way. He says, your actions are out of line with an actual relationship with me. I don't care how much you know, how much of a teacher of the law you know, your actions are not acting as if you believe that a relationship is what was lost here. And that's what I'm searching for. She has. And, she, and he just elevates her as an example. This is what it looks like. And he's like, look, he's not saying she didn't sin. At the very end, he says, your sins are forgiven. He's saying, this is what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for someone who's high, got the highest score on this life scale. I'm not looking for the person with the best yard. I'm looking for the person who's willing to come over to my house and sit there and talk with me. Because, and he says, I've forgiven her sins. And it says that her love demonstrated was a, 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 an indicator that her sins had forgiven, that she had understood her sins had been forgiven. And so for us, Jesus has forgiven our sins. Let us not be the Pharisee, the, the teacher of law, Simon, who just trying to be good enough and looking down, oh, God surely won't be with them. Look at their life. It's a mess. No, no, no. Let's rush to God's feet. Let's accept that invitation to take tea with God. Sit there and learn. Tell us, how can I implement your practices in my life? How can I grow my garden, if you will, to bring life to what I have? And then what, what, what God does is he says, okay, now that you've implemented this, now that you've tried this at your house, go. Share it with the whole neighborhood. Don't let this be a secret. Go walk up and down the street. Teach them how to grow their garden. Show them how to really live this life full of life. And that's what God wants us to do after we believe in him for the forgiveness of our sins. And that's what our church could be. If we accept God's invitation to relationship, we sit down with him, we learn who he is, we recognize and see the transforming power of his love in our own life, in our own yard, then we get to take that beyond ourselves and to the entire neighborhood, our entire networks, so that everyone might have the life that God wants them to have. Living our lives beyond ourselves. There's a very powerful scripture in James chapter 1 that helps us define what living our lives beyond ourselves looks like. If anyone considers himself religious, now you could substitute that word religious for if anyone considers themselves to be a Christian considers themselves to be godly. Or say, Can, I'm a churchgoer, a believer. If anyone considers themselves religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his or her tongue, that person deceives themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Right down the street from us is a ministry called Hope's Promise. Hope's Promise is a ministry to orphans and families that are working in the adoptive service area. Hope's Promise has orphanages in Kenya, in uh, Uzbekistan, no, Kenya, Vietnam, uh, Zimbabwe, and one other one. They have orphanage homes there. They have five of them. But then they also do adoptive services. So they help families where you might have a pregnancy where they want to use their pregnancy to bless another family. Or it may be for those people that can't have children and then are receiving the adoptive child. Hope's Promise has been doing ministry for probably about 25 years. And last year, we all participated in a project with them where we created boxes of hope. And what those boxes had in them were, were things for adoptive families. So when a family came to Castle Rock and met with the 
the agency and received their baby, they were also, they were given this box on their way out the door. Now, also those boxes were given to the, to the mommies who had the baby that was uh, given to another family. So they gave them to both sides of the, of the story. Those boxes, everybody, have been a huge, huge blessing. So what we did was we, each one of our families got a list of some of the things to put in these boxes, and we created those boxes, each one of us. Sarah Cremesino put everything in those boxes and delivered them over to Hope's Promise. And every time that they have a situation where they want to give to a family that box, they present that to them, and they are an incredible, incredible blessing to those people. But we're going to do that again. And coming up in the next week or two, we will have a presentation of what that needs to look like. So each one of us will create one of these boxes. Actually, what we will do is we will purchase the contents of those boxes. And then we will put them together and we'll take them over to Hope's Promise. Hope's Promise recently made a huge... Uh, I don't know if it's philosophical change, but they were discovering that what they were doing with the orphans and the adoptive side was not working. Some things were going wrong where they didn't quite have the money to be able to function the way that they needed to. Everything was fine. They just weren't, they just weren't getting the amount of uh, adoptions that they needed to help fund what, what they were doing. So one of the things that they did was they decided to do a shift in philosophy to move away from being purely faith-based, and they decided to get into foster care. Now, foster care is a state-run deal. The lady that is the CEO right now was really concerned about telling the woman who started Hope's Promise that, hey, you know what? We think we need to shift how we're doing things and wanted to get her blessing. So that conversation was had. The woman that founded the, the agency gave Beth the blessing and said, you know what? This is awesome. This is great. You go ahead and do this. I think it's a good, good thing. And so they had to live beyond themselves as an organization in order to propel what they were doing, have more impact, and then make it so that the, that the organization could keep functioning. This Tuesday, they are going to have a little brunch. And Beyond Church is going to pay for that. We are going to make it happen. We're going to help them. We're going to bless them with, with that lunch. Now, one of the things that we want to do is congratulate them on this huge move because the decision that they made to go, to go this direction and to make this happen is a big, big deal. So outside, when you leave, is going to be a big card, and I would like all of us, all, that elbow your neighbor, say, that's you too, okay? Don't just run out of here, but every one of us, whether you've been here uh, 10 years or 10 days, Every one of us sign that card. If you have a scripture that you would like to put on it, go ahead and put that down. If you want to say good luck, if you just want to write your name, that's fine. But, but if you want to say uh, great move, way to be, way to awesome, way to go, we're standing behind you, whatever it wants to be, let's fill that card up with our signatures and our positive words. And then we're going to present that to them on Tuesday when we have this little lunch. So they are, they went and, and are recognized some things that were going around them and then had to make some difficult decisions to, to live beyond themselves. They were comfortable, but then they needed to do some things. I am in this similar situation. I have been doing church now for 26 years as a pastor. And have kind of been just kind of cruising along. And I need to do something beyond myself. I need to. It's, it's easy. 
Well, it's really hard to pastor, but it's easy to just kind of cruise sometimes in, in the things that you do. And I don't want to be that way anymore. I want to live my life beyond myself. So Shauna and I have talked a ton. We have prayed. We thought all this through. Talked to a bunch of overseers. I have decided to retire from pastoral ministry. I'll say it one more time. Some of you may not have heard me. I'm going to retire from pastoral ministry and go a new direction. Sean and I have some ideas. We believe that the Lord is directing us. I think that even somebody like me has to do something every once in a while to shake up our lives. I've talked to too many people who have pastors who, who are just getting to the end of their life and they just try and cruise into retirement. I don't want to do that. I've got plenty of energy, plenty of life. Shauna certainly does too. And we have some things that we want to try. Now, we've talked, we've, we've got a lot of ideas. We're not sure exactly what that's going to look like. But October 18th will be our last Sunday as pastors here. And we are very, very excited about what the Lord is doing and have to believe that the Lord's hand is on this church in such a way as to direct it through the past few years. And things have been set up beautifully so that this church is created to be missio-centric rather than persona-centric. And I think the Lord wants to give some, somebody else another opportunity to pastor here for, for the next 10 years. And so I have to believe that cool, cool things are going to happen here. And I, would, I, I, I cannot wait for Beyond Church to be so impactful in our town that one service isn't enough, two services aren't enough, this building is not enough, and there's more, way more to be done in the future. We have an elders meeting this Tuesday night. I would ask any of you if you could pray and fast for us. Things are, are, are going well, and I have an elder who, who is up here somewhere waiting to, to come share with you just a little bit more. But know that the Lord is directing and guiding. He is helping us. He is encouraging us. And I have to believe that great, amazing, cool things are going to happen not only in our lives, the lives of our families, but the life of this church. I love this guy. This guy, I don't know if you know this, Pastor Mark was my youth pastor growing up, so it's pretty awesome. Uh, my name is Nathan Cremacino. I'm one of the elders. Um, I usually hang out in the back, looking at the back of your heads. Uh, some people call it the sound booth. I call it the comfort zone. Um, but this morning, I get to talk to you guys up here. Um, pastor Mark has been serving Beyond Church faithfully for 42 days, <laughs> which is awesome, right? But for those of you who are a little new, uh, we just changed the name to Beyond Church, and he's been serving Castle Rock Bible Church for 11 years and, and doing an amazing, amazing job. So I was talking to Pastor Mark, and there's kind of this myth out there that um, there's two ways that a pastor is not a pastor anymore. He either, like, dies right here, and it's really uncomfortable. Or there's some kind of weird scandal, which is also uncomfortable. Well, as one of the elders here, I want to tell you there's no scandal. Everything is wonderful. We're very happy for Pastor Mark and Miss Shauna and their future. Um, yeah, so I want to get that out first and foremost. There's no scandal. It's great. It's a wonderful thing. Um, I had to pull out my notes. I'm glad I made some. I wasn't going to, but. Um, so when he told the elders and the overseer, or and, the, and the trustees. This is, this is Ron Sparks. He's the chairman of the trustees. Super amazing guy. We, we were a little bit surprised. I imagine, was anyone in here surprised this morning? A little bit? Shocked? 
Uh, I want to tell you something else. God was not surprised that this is happening. God's not up in heaven going, wait, what, Mark? Hold on. Hold on a second. Mark can't retire. That's not going to work. So God's not surprised. So we can have faith that things are going to be great because God's still the God of this church. God's still the head of this church. Mark's not the head of this church. He, he wasn't the head of this church. God has always been the head of this church. Oh, it wants me to undo my typing. Don't shake your phone. It undoes your typing. Um, so over the past year, we've been, we've been updating bylaws. We, we created a board of trustees we, so that the, the elders don't have to worry about money anymore. And these guys are like the smartest money guys ever. Things are so healthy right now. When the, when the elders go to the trustees meetings, it's like, wow, you guys are really, really doing well. So I want to let you know that everything is really, really good. Um, we've been talking to Pastor Mark about this. He mentioned the missio-centric versus persona-centric kind of thing. And he was sensing and we were sensing, and probably a lot of you, it was kind of like Mark's church. It was all about Mark. It was all about Pastor Mark. It was all about what, what's Mark going to say? And we've been really making this push with Beyond Church to more of a missio-centric. It's all about what the church wants to do, what God wants to do through our church, which is live beyond ourselves. Live God's love, live God's love beyond ourselves. And so we're really pushing to be, to push that mission. Um, so what's going to happen next is um, because we have these amazing trustees, Ron will be the head of the selection committee for the new senior pastor of our church. And that part, that's already in progress. Um, that selection committee will have some elders and some trustees and some of you guys. We wrote into the bylaws that some of you guys will be a part of that. So if you get a phone call from Ron, that's why. If you don't answer it, um, bummer. <laughs> you should, because you get to hang out. Yeah, because it's Ron. You get to hang out with Ron. And, uh, and help be, you know, part of the future of this church. Um, so as Pastor Mark mentioned, October 18th will be his last Sunday. Um, he received counsel from the overseers that to make it a quick transition, not drag it out, not draw it out. And we all agree with that. The trustees and elders, we agree that that's absolutely the best way to do this. Don't, you know, all right, so it's going to be January 1st. You know, that just makes it really uncomfortable for everybody to drag it out too long. So October 18th, we're all super excited for that. And we're super excited about the future of this church, the future of Beyond Church. So, all right. He didn't want to say anything, but I told him I might let him. Oh, thanks. Um, so last December, uh, when we were putting together the budget for 2020, and everybody can remember last December, right? Nobody knew what 2020 was going to be like. But I remember we had a joint meeting with the elders and all the staff, and we were going over everything. And we really, as a church, stepped out on faith in a big way uh, with our budget and just our direction and think er where we were going. And I remember saying to everybody, I said, look, I said, we have to have faith like we've had never before. And I've repeated that in every trustees meeting this year. And I believe that if we continue to have faith, um, God our Father, through his son Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will see us through this as well. And he will see Pastor Mark and Shauna through their transition as well. So that's really all I wanted to say. And I will actually be the interim president, um, not, the, not the interim pastor, don't get me wrong there. <laughs> the interim president, so all the financial things and all that, I'll, I promise I'll take good care of that uh, during the transition as well. So, great. Yeah, if you have any questions about this, this process, this guy. And, and Pastor Mark would love to talk to you if you have any questions, too. He's an open book, I think. He's not really nodding vigorously, but he is. So, yeah, if you have any questions, talk to him. You can come talk to me. Um, our other two elders aren't here today. Uh, they planned vacations around this somehow, uh, impressively, you know, months ago. So good for them. Um, so anyways, I want to go ahead and close. If, if, there, if you guys want to respond to Pastor Brad's sermon this morning, you're welcome to come up here. There will be people to pray. Um, 
one of the things that I've been wanting to change our wording in these uh, altar calls is getting rid of the word need. Coming up here and praying isn't a need, it's a want. If you just want to come up and tell someone like an amazing thing that happened, something that God's doing in your life, come up and pray with them. If you just want to come up and say, hey, I want to pray with you. Can you pray with me also? Do that. So this isn't something that's going to, it's weird. If you come up here, like, come on up. It's great. So there will be people up here to pray with you if you'd like to. Um, Ron will be available. I'll be back in the comfort zone working again. But if you want to come talk to me, you're welcome to. So, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Thank you so much, Jesus, for this morning. God, thank you that this is your church. Thank you that we do not have to fear for the future because you're in control and you're in charge. Thank you that you love us. You have a plan for our future. You have a plan for the future of this church. You have a plan for the future of Pastor Mark and Miss Shauna as they venture out. God, we pray, pray your great blessing upon them in everything they do in their ventures. Um, we love them so much. You love them so much. They've been a wonderful blessing to us. And, uh, just can, uh, continue to bless their lives. Be with each and every one of us as we go out today. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.